you so much, Dr. Cook. Uh, let me make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. Hopefully everyone is seeing the violence of silence, a call to, a call to speak up and act for a librarianship. Um, all right, that is great. And so I am so pleased to be here talking to you all. Um, and before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the many, many people who have um, been a part of this journey to get me to this place where I am talking to you all um, here today. Um, there's many of them in the audience. Uh, some of them don't want me to uh, acknowledge them, and so I won't, but uh, one person that I do want to acknowledge is Dr. Raymond Pun for uh, his assistance in this wonderful slide deck that you're seeing here today. Um, you know, without him, it'd probably look just very, very plain. Um, and so I will go ahead and get started um, and uh, do this. So I just want to take a second to just breathe. Um, I know that this is a particularly uh, difficult uh, topic. Um, I know that I, I have struggled uh, with how to approach this, um, what words should I use, what images, um, and more. And so just want to uh, take this opportunity for us to just breathe. Um, here today, just breathing deeply. Um, and this allows me to calm down. Um, so my heart is not racing. So my peace is not um, like a bullet train. Um, and then I would also like to take a moment of silence for those who have passed. Um, those who have passed due to systemic racism, police brutality, uh, those who have passed due to the pandemic. I just like to take a moment of silence. Thank you. And acknowledging that silence can be used in many ways, um, and and in particular giving notice to the lives lost. Um, I would like to thank a very very dear friend for helping me come up with this topic. Um, and what, without their support, I wouldn't be here. And I would also like to uh, thank. The work of Augusta Baker and Dr. Nicole Cook, um, without them, definitely would not be here uh, to speak to you all here today. And so the, the session here today um, is talking about silence, um, how they can be deafening, how the emissions can be damaging, um, how a lot of us have um, dealt with oppression and that it can be all consuming and everywhere. Um, and that silence has done and caused irreparable harm and damage and trauma. Um, but the power that GLAM has, gallery, libraries, archives, and museums are immense and they're great. Um, but yet, acknowledging that there are silences that exist in these powerful spaces even to this day. Um, and even thinking about how they harm underrepresented groups, particularly BIPOC library workers. And we've seen even about two to three weeks ago and, and more um, that the result of physical violence, but we know that it's more than just physical, it's psychological and emotional, um, that the silence is insidious, subtle, it's inv invisible, it can destroy hope, erode fate, and it can breed mistrust. There is silence in not speaking up because sometimes you never know what the situation you're getting yourself into. And so the point of this talk is to dive into this, to examine these some more, but to also engage um, in this topic. And this is just, this is not even the beginning, this is a continuation. And so I would like to acknowledge um, the land uh, that UF currently stands on. Um, UF Libraries acknowledges that for thousands of years, the area now comprised the state of Florida has been and continues to be the home of many native nations. We further recognize that the main campus of the University of Florida is located in a heartland territory of two historically known native societies, those of the Potano and those of the Alachua Seminole. As part of our current stewardship, the UF Libraries acknowledges its obligation to honor the ancestral present and future native residents of Florida. And I will also like to acknowledge those who are forcibly taking and enslaved in what we now call the United States of America. We can learn to work and speak 
when we are afraid in the same way that we have learned to work and speak when we are tired by Audre Lorde. Uh, this is a key quote that resonated with me when I saw this. Um, just like how the pandemic started, all of a sudden we had to we had to go from being majority in person to online, and now it's been a year um, since then. Um, and somehow we have gotten used to it. Not that it's normal, but how we must encourage ourselves to speak up, um, to not be comfortable with the silences. And a quote from Mel Mulcahy, Dr. Reverend, Luth Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So these are the brave space agreements that I would like to use. Um, and this is something that I ended up um, um, first seeing at the ACRL uh, uh, virtual conference last year that they had um, around ALA um, and uh, Mackenzie Mack, uh, they were the keynote um, and I saw this, I reached out to them, you know, asked them, you know, how can I cite them, provide attribution. Um, and so uh, for the Brave Space Agreements, we agreed to struggle against racism, sexism, transphobia, classism, sexism, ableism, ageism, rankism, and the way we internalize myths and misinformation about our own identities the identities of other people. We know that no space can be completely safe and we agree to work together towards harm reduction, centering those most affected by injustice in the room, even if it means centering ourselves. We agree to sit with the discomfort that comes with having conversations about race, gender, identity, the nonprofit industrial complex, et cetera. We agree to try our best, and that is what I'm really asking you all to hear today, not to shame or guilt ourselves for the vulnerability that these kinds of conversations require. We agree to value the viewpoints of other people that do not challenge or conflict with our right to exist or challenge or conflict with another's right to exist. We agree that it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to feel uncomfortable when we're discussing complex topics about boundaries, accountability, personal relationships, organizational relationships, justice and care. And Brave Space is an original concept coined by Mickey Scott Bay Jones. And so if you agree, please, and you have access to the chat box, please type in, I agree. So you agree to adhere uh, to this during uh, the session here today. And so we'll give folks a moment to do so. Thank you. Um, and then next up, um, uh, Dr. Cook and Grace will be monitoring the chat, but I would also like to use progressive stacking. Uh, this is a technique intended to give underrepresented voices a chance to speak, particularly in an environment where there's a dominant group. So if you choose to self-identify as belonging to an underrepresented group, um, especially Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC, and like to ask a question or make a comment in the chat box, uh, please include an asterisk at the start of your question or comment and that your question or comment will be prioritized. And so don't forget that. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, so Dr. Koch had mentioned, I work at the University of Florida. Um, I am the inaugural diversity, equity and inclusion librarian. Uh, but I was born and raised on the island of St. Thomas, which is a part of the United States Virgin Islands. And now we've been underneath the US flag for 104 years as of yesterday. Um, I am black Afro-Caribbean and I'm a first generation American. I'm also a 2013 Spectrum Scholar um, and a graduate of the United, I was about to say United States, University of Washington MLIS program. Um, I have many identities um, and there's many more that you see and some that you don't see. Um, but for me, the key thing that I want you all to know uh, is that I'm very, very passionate about libraries and I've always wanted to become a librarian since middle school. And so this is a dream for me, dream come true for me. But when I decided to become a librarian, I didn't know that I would be entering a field that was 86.7% white. And that in many spaces that I would end up being the only one or one of you or the darkest person in the room. So just also acknowledging that April is Black Women's History Month, National Minority Health Month, National Poetry Month for the poets in the room, 
Rec is an information management month, school library month, so acknowledging those who are school library workers. Uh, big up to you all. And that is stress awareness month, because stress takes an incredible toll on us and can lead to burnout um, in, in many different ways. So acknowledging the silences in 2020 and 2021, and there's many, many more, um, but there's been a number of things that um, we've all witnessed um, and experienced. We saw that the pandemic um, took us from being in person to home. We saw how there was just a lot of inequities that immediately came to light to the dominant um, perspective. We saw a surge, a resurgence of anti-Asian racism. We saw George Floyd and Breonna Taylor murdered. We saw the Black Lives Matter movement once again. And how I like to categorize it is that most of the world recognizing that racism is still a thing. We saw that the White House, the previous administration, put in place a White House executive order against race and gender stereotyping. That for some places put a complete halt towards diversity training and education and initiatives. We saw the elections. We saw an insurrection. We saw Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander folks being hated, discriminated against and murdered. And now we are here. Are statements enough? Many of you in the audience have probably either written a statement, read one, um, seen enough of them. Are statements enough? Feel free to enter in your thoughts in the chat box because I really do want to engage with you all. Are statements enough? I've been pulled in to write my own share of statements. The statements give people an opportunity to say, this is where they are. This is what they're thinking. That's what they're hoping to go. When these statements are crafted off of the backs of people who are suffering, imagine that you're one of three, one of two, the only one and being asked to put your trauma on display for others. This additional emotional labor that aids in racial battle fatigue, that you must somehow be stoic, still come to work and not have your suffering acknowledged, that, that they, these places are engaging in trauma porn that is just there for their pleasure, for their satisfaction, but they don't take anything and learn from it. So our statements are enough. We've seen plenty. And there's plenty more that is going to come. But in six months, a year, five years from now, will they have cashed in, made their promise that they put in statements that they are going to be ending racism, eradicating anti-Black racism and anti-Asian racism? Are there enough? So um, I had sent some readings um, to you all um, and just wanted to dive into them a little bit. Um, and it's okay if you all haven't had the chance to, to go um, into them because you'll have the opportunity to do so um, afterwards. But the buzz MLK and the violence of white silence talks about the issues of social justice starts with conversations in our minds. Sometimes we have to be careful about what we say and how we say it, but first having that conversation with ourselves, silence with others. Being loud about racial injustice means different things for different people. We all have power. We all have power. It's for us to acknowledge what power we have and being able to utilize it and wield it in the ways that are necessary. The silence in the world. We all make some difference in the nature of our world. And we have to think about what is that difference that we will be making. Sometimes that means 
engaging with family members, who says things, who laughs about things. People talk about um, fairness and respect, but it's hard to be fair and respect someone you don't see as a human being. So what does that mean? What resonated with you all in these readings? What are some of the things that drew you to them? For Audre Lord said, what is the most important thing to me must be spoken, made verbal, shared even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. How many times have we bitten our tongue that we've stopped ourselves from speaking up, that we've held back others, that we've tone policed or we've policed ourselves. My silences have not protected me. There's many times I've been silent when I should have spoken up. And those are times that I regret. But what are the words that you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make them your own until you sicken and die of them, still in silence? Our silences does not protect us. What silence is racial violence? To be silent is to allow the status quo to continue. Thinking about the gaps in our records, thinking about how we go about our daily life. Sometimes we just move through things without assuming, with, with assuming things and that everyone has the same way of navigating life. To choose white comfort and privilege over racial equality. And the same thing can be said for other unrepresented and oppressed groups. And the very idea that anyone can stay comfortable while so many are suffering is an excellent example of privilege. And equal rights for one, for others, does not mean less rights for you. So not buying into that scarcity mindset as we navigate this work, even thinking about who are in your circles, what identities do you have, what positions and power do you hold? What can you give up? What can you give to others? You're never really a whole person if you remain silent. It is necessary to teach by living and speak those truths for which we believe and, be, and know beyond understanding. Think about this. How many times you've wished that someone has spoken up for you, was there, engaged, asked a question, said hi. Can we only acknowledge struggle when there is a march or a tragedy? Do we have to wait until, and this is gonna sound crass, when bodies hit the floor and people lose their lives and their livelihoods? Is that the only time that we acknowledge and we strive towards equity and inclusion when, we, when there is a loss? The outcry to end racial injustice is not one moment of loud love. So maybe some of you have protested in many different ways. But would you stand with us in your homes, in your schools, in your workplaces? No justice, no peace, but it seems that silence have, is ringing more loudly than anything else. And there's different ways to speak. There's different ways to get involved. The fact that you have to protest for your right to live that's a controversial statement, isn't it? And think about the characteristics of white supremacy culture. White supremacy culture is not just something that um, is only tied to um, the white majority. Um, 
they're all characteristics of white supremacy that I, when I first came about it, that I saw myself in. Perfectionism. How many of us are overachievers? Um, and really thinking about how there's little time, energy, and money put into reflection, identifying lessons learned that can improve practice. How many times that we have been asked to produce, produce, produce? Fear of open conflict. The culture of niceness that exists in librarianship, that people would rather be polite and nice than to be in conflict, to, than to be uncomfortable. That if you talk about a difficult issue, that you're impolite, you're rude, you're out of line, you're unprofessional, and how professionalism has been weaponized. Library nice. That we must make sure that everyone is at ease, at peace. We can't contradict each other. We can't be in disagreement. We can't butt heads. We can't discuss the tough issues. Objectivity, invalidating people who show emotion. We must be stoic. There's been times when it's been so hard to breathe that I am barely able to function dealing with just the suffering and the emotional pain and that but yet I must disrupt at work with a smile on my face. It's gotten to the point where I've responded, I am here and leave it at that. But if you show emotion, if you cry, if you get too angry, I have to modulate myself so that I don't become too passionate, so I don't become too aggressive. The right to comfort. The belief that those with power have a right to emotional and psychological comfort. Everything comes second to their comfort. So how many times have that happened where you have either been comforted or someone else had to suffer for your comfort? We are socialized to respect fear more than our own needs for language and definition. The weight of that silence will choke us. There's endless ways that we rob ourselves and each other. We've become too comfortable. Sometimes it's easy to opt out and we don't want to. It's a natural human inclination to not want to deal with things that are painful. It is. To deal with things that are uncomfortable, that makes us feel any negative emotions. But some of us, we don't get that option to opt out, to turn away to choose to be someone else. Sometimes it feels like it's become tradition to be silent on what matters the most and that we've become accustomed to silences. And to begin to be not being acknowledged, to be invisible, you feel that you're not wanted. You feel that you're shunned. You feel like our lives, livelihoods don't matter and voices don't matter. Um, and I would like to acknowledge some folks who've started to do this research, and there's many more that I couldn't um, put on the screen, um, but also just acknowledging some key folks. Uh, Katrina's uh, work, um, along with Ione Damasco, um, that they've done their uh, study on low morale and ethnic and racial minority uh, academic librarians, um, but low morale has uh, research has continued um, most recently with a publication um, out in regards to public library workers, thinking about vocational awe by Fabazi Yatar and how that we must be willing to put our profession above everyone else, you know, everything else, that our professional identity, our jobs comes before us, that we must be willing to sacrifice everything. You know, and that librarianship is above reproach, is above critique, um, and that we must be willing to work through breaks, do everything and every anything. And we've seen that time and time again during the pandemic, how people had folks still working through in 2020 when we found out that um, we were dealing with this pandemic. And some of you all might still be dealing with that. Um, 
and then locating the library and institutional oppression, you know, they have a sentence in there. When we look into the collections, the actual information contains in library and how organized, you can see that it's surely by accident somehow manages to construct wherein whiteness, it constructs reality wherein whiteness is default, normal, civilized, and everything else is other. Think about this. In our associations, in our library programs, when do you learn about your racial identity? When do you learn about oppression? When do you learn that for some people, all they've ever known was omissions, absences, and silences? This may be new to some, but familiar to most. This is the ALA member demographics that was conducted in 2017 and 2014. So 86.7% white. Um, there's been a lot of push over the last few decades for librarianship to be more reflective of the society of the patrons uh, that we serve and the society that we live in. Uh, but we haven't quite gotten there um, despite the Spectrum Scholarship Program, the Kaleidoscope um, and more that exist. Why is that? What gatekeeping exists to make sure that the status quo um, exists? What are some of the things that we that needs to be done to dismantle this? But also thinking about how those who get in, what do they have to do to stay? And what are they currently doing to stay beyond five years? 10 years, 15, 20, 25 years. What aspects of themselves do they have to strip away or engage in deauthentication, according to Katrina's research? It goes from micro to macro, from individual to system. Think about our spaces. Who actually is represented? And who's not? Why are they represented? A lot of people like to talk about neutrality and objectivity. Our services, who are they centering and who are they not centering? What does it mean for libraries and individuals to own up to their whiteness or complicitly in upholding whiteness to challenge these silences? What are the impact that it has in BIPOC folks? during COVID-19, the civil and social unrest. But also thinking about the fact that we have a profession that's 86.7% white and is majority female, but also thinking about how, um, how we actually navigate and understand this world. How do we challenge and have difficult painstaking and painful conversations and work and spaces that is not one-off, but is continuous. How do we engage with the decades and centuries of this work? Some people like to grow to what is next? What do I need to do? You're telling me this. Is there a checklist? Is there a solution? Is there something that I can do at this moment right now? And part of the work is for us to sit and to reflect and to think and to ponder. If you're reacting to this conversation in a multitude of ways, why are you reacting the way that you're reacting? Owning up to what our history have given us, has led to understanding our history. For me, I work at an institution that is a historically, traditionally, predominantly white institution in the deep South. What does that mean? You know, working in a library where I'm one of five black faculty members with only one black faculty member that has been tenured. What does it mean having to be the only one and being feel, feeling like I'm a representation of my race and ethnicity? 
what does it mean when I have to step back in order to make someone else more comfortable to feel that I have to make other things, make people more palatable? What does it mean when I'm tapped in and that I'm simultaneously engaging in erasure and hypervisibility? That dealing with the, the double consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois talks about you know, thinking about how the fact that by the color, because of the color of my skin, that it impacts the length of time that I have on this planet and my access to healthcare and more on how people perceive me and think that I'm just a diversity hire um, and that I am presumed incompetent before I open my mouth and that people question my authority, question my intelligence continuously questioning me to the point that I've been questioning myself for so long. And then I also continue to question others. Thinking about the fragility that people have. Thinking about the fact that there's two pandemics, COVID-19, but also racism. Thinking about the emotional labor that without the groups that I have, the villages of people that have been in my corner, surviving this with my mental health intact would have been the biggest burden for me besides trying to survive, physically survive this pandemic. Thinking about how we have now transformed into anti-racist practices, but really what does that mean for you, for your institution, how do you define it? And thinking about silence, whether someone, it's not just what someone do, it's the absence of having that conversation. It's the absence of having that discussion. It's the absence that for some people, do you look around and see why, why don't we have people of color? Why is it only this homogenous group represented? And so I'm curious to know, and feel if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to put it, what silences have you endured or witnessed? What are things that you've seen that you couldn't tell anyone? And you can send it to me personally, you can send it to Grace, you can send it to Dr. Cook. What silences have you witnessed or endured? Things that have built up inside you, that it impacts how you engage with others. When we think about this, I think about the fact that some people have been monitored, watched, pursued, that their way of living have been impacted because people see them as criminals, as less than. But even thinking about, when we think about archives and special collection, there are some people who do not feel that their voices are worthy of being preserved because there's been people who still couldn't get a library card. There's people who are still fighting to gain access to the basic human necessities. How many times have you been dismissed, minimized, invalidated? How many times have people asked you where you were from? No, where you're really from. No, where you're really, really from. You know, saying that you're not this. You don't belong. You're not here. You're not one of us. We don't want you. We're, bit, we're tolerating you for a short amount of time. That you don't engage because you have been dismissed over and over again. How many times have you been invited to the table and that you don't have no place to sit, that you've been shackled, that you talk, people talk over you. You're there trying to wave your hands to, for people to pay attention to you, but everyone ignores you. How many times have you had to strip away parts of yourself that there's nothing left so that you don't paint a target on your back? 
how many times have people told you, well, no one is interested in your story. No one is interested in your history. No one's interested in you. When we think of that and we hear that time and time again, and people don't have to say it, it's by it not being represented at all or misrepresented in a lot of cases. How many times have you struggled to find your voice for other people to crush it, for, for it to be part of this melting pot? We are all one, we're the human race. If we are the human race and all lives matter, right? Why do we have people dying due to these, 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 these social constructs, these identities? And we think about this. The violence is in emotional. That emotional labor of having to figure out how do I inform my supervisor, my dean, my colleagues? How do I make them understand? How do I make them see from my perspective without maybe losing political capital or sway? How do I make sure that I don't end up having to deal with any potential blowback or repercussion or retaliation um, from what it is that I've said or have done? How do I show up for myself and show up for others and still keep my job? How do I do this and I am suffering tenfold, twentyfold? How do I do this knowing that my workload is unrealistic and that I am grieving and suffering and dealing with Samor simultaneously, collectively, but also personally? How do I deal with the stress and how it is impacting my body and how I can't sleep? I can't function anymore. Thinking about how I'm being continuously triggered and trauma, tra we traumatized for a lot of people. When we think about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how it is aiding in the psychological, emotional, and re-traumatization, you know, that we need to focus on everyone, meaning we focus on no one. There's this phrase that I heard um, in grad school, death by a thousand paper cuts. And I like to remix it a little bit and think about more like death by endless unceasing soul destroying silence. We're not innocent or blameless. We have our own roles and responsibilities, whether we're conscious of it or not in perpetuating the silence that has led us to this moment. There is no checklist, but there are some considerations. And I wanna make sure there's enough time for uh, questions that you all might have and to go through this wonderful chat that I saw going by. Um, notice, awareness and learn. Noticing what is happening, having a keen awareness of what is going on and learning. Going beyond reading I, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi a white fragility by Robin D'Angelo. What are some local authors, experts who are doing this work that you can get engaged in? Who are the most vulnerable communities, excuse me, that have been silenced? Who don't feel comfortable, who's dealing with intergenerational and historic um, trauma? Power dynamics, who has the power? Why do they have the power? Can the power be negated or shared with others and used to empower others? The very fact that I speak English, I have two degrees, uh, I'm employed, there's a lot of power that I have and the power is situational as well. And how is it being used? Is it being used to aid others? Is it being used to suppress others? 
And this means looking at it for every situation that we're in and not making assumptions and not being reactive towards things. How engaged are you or not? Speaking up, what does that look like? Not engaging this whisper allyship that Brittany Cooper had talked about where you know there's silence when you make a powerful statement or when you say something or you stood up in someone else's behalf and there's just silence and then they just proceed to the next thing on the agenda or uh, they just have two moments of silence and that's it. Are you able to engage and say, well, you know what? We need to come back around to this. We need to stop and acknowledge this. And we need to reflect. We need to create, maintain, and promote equitable spaces. If someone does not feel comfortable, if someone does not feel that they belong, if someone feels as though they will not be heard, why is that? What organization, what is about the organizational culture, the norms, behaviors that has allowed this to for this to happen and to be perpetuated. These are the things that I'm saying is nothing new. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not somehow saying things that people haven't in this room said before that you haven't read anywhere before. But really thinking about also your motivation for doing this. Thinking about how this needs to be done, that this is continuous, this is lifelong work. How for me, seven years ago, I didn't even, I couldn't understand most of this terminology that I was saying, but I've educated myself and continuing to do so. But it was also making sure that you're not sharpening your knives and someone else. As you're gaining this knowledge, okay, that you're not using it and weaponizing it against other people. And that you're just not focusing on saying the right thing. And instead of doing the right thing, I'm doing the right thing. When we think about these, these, these silences, whether we silence ourselves or we, or we're working to silent working or silencing others, do you think about the impact that it has? Action is to be action is to be the last consideration. Thinking about this pneumatic device. Wait, why am I talking? Considering thinking twice before you say something. But not only before you say it, but what would the impact be on this person? Intent versus impact. People like to say, it wasn't my intention, but the impact is this. This person was hurt. This person felt diminished, invalidated. What are you gonna do about that impact? But thinking about our actions, creating our own individualized plan in order to do this, but also acknowledging that this does not have to be done in silence, well, by ourselves, that this is community work, this is communal work, this is collective action that we are working towards. And thinking about the why, the why, as we're moving towards equity and inclusion, when I think about equitable practices and inclusive practices, let's think about the exclusionary ones that existed and still exist. Let's think about the ones where um, it privileges some and disenfranchise others. Let's think about the coded language that currently exists and that we use without a moment's notice. Let's think about these communities that we look down upon, whether we're conscious of it or not. Let's think about the people we're, we're recruiting into this profession and that we don't want them to have to suffer as others have. But also thinking about the fact that we want to create a future that doesn't exist. And in order to do that, we have to be willing 
to let go of what we thought was true or right. That we're working to envision a world that does not exist and create a world that does not exist. And that this will not happen suddenly, this will not happen swiftly. But this is calling out isms and phobias and doing something about it. So where do we go from here? Y'all better get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I don't, I'm going to say it time and time again. For those who are suffering in silence, find your villages. Find people who are going to speak for you, speak up on your behalf, who's going to amplify your voices, who's going to acknowledge your existence and say that you are worthy. For those people who consider themselves allies, as someone says, the application for allyship is closed. We are looking for co-conspirators. We're looking for accomplices. We're looking for liberators. We're looking for abolitionists. We're looking for people who are going to be there with us and suffering alongside us and working to dismantle this world that we currently exist in. That there is nothing for us without us. I might have missed said that. But if you're working on um, working with different communities, making sure that they are co-collaborators and co-creators and that they're just not uh, subjects or people that you use and abuse and leave them there. That your silence aids in our oppression. And so I would like to say thank you once again for allowing me to have to bend you all's air for 49 minutes at this point. Um, this is my contact information. You can follow me um, on Twitter. And these are my references. Um, and I am open to questions. And I know that we only have 10 minutes, um, but feel free to hit me up on Twitter or contact me via my email to keep the conversation going. All right, thank you so much for this. Um, amazing as usual. And so we don't have any questions yet, so uh, we still have time. Uh, Tawana, there's uh, lots of kudos and, and good things in the comments. Uh, so I will try and save that file so you can have, uh, you can read that over uh, at, your, at your leisure. So uh, you can still put the questions in the chat, but also, um, you know, let's be adventurous today. Um, and at the bottom of your screens, uh, hopefully you see that there is a little icon called reactions. Uh, and if you click on that, you can raise your hand. Um, and if folks have questions, we can try uh, unmuting folks and you can have a chat directly with Tawana. Please don't suffer in silence, like legitimately do not <laughs> suffer in silence. Do not do I'm not, I'm not a scary person. I don't bite. I mean, I couldn't bite even if I wanted to because this is virtual. Um, but I know that this is not an easy topic. Right. Um, it, it, I, there's, there are several folks who, who are here who knows that how I toiled over this and struggled to figure out how do, how do I put this in words? Um, how do I put this in words so that people understand, but also they can take something from this that everyone here could see themselves um, and see someone else and being able um, to connect to what it is that they've experienced or someone close to them have experienced. Um, and feel free to ask the challenging questions. Stump me. This is a challenge now. Um, so let me ask you while, while folks are thinking, um, <laughs> is there, would there ever be a situation or a scenario where you would tell someone not to enter the profession because of the silences and really some of the abuses that you have described and I know that many of us have endured in different places and in different ways. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I think for me, I don't hold anything back. Um, I, I, I cannot in good conscience bring someone in um, to a profession um, or even a place that would not that would not even acknowledge them, let alone celebrate them, you know. Um, and 
it's like, why would you stay someplace that is, is this continuously abusing you, you know? Um, and there's many reasons why people stay and they stay to fight and make it better. Um, but for me, I, I'm choosing to stay in librarianship um, because I'm cautiously optimistic about things. I know things are not gonna change drastically, but for me, it's, it's making sure that as someone says, going into this eyes wide open, that you're real conscious of what it is that you're gonna potentially be getting into um, and being able to have that support to deal with this, you know, because this is not a field you survive by yourself. You know, you survive by connecting with people, with groups like we here, you know, with, you know, being engaged in the alcoves um, by uh, going to conferences like JCLC and more. Yeah, absolutely. So a question came in, communities and libraries are not separate, but we often approach them as separate, the professional and the personal. How do we go about managing the harms enacted by our community that I think is trickles in uh, and is reflected in our library? A really good question. I'm struggling in how to um, go about managing the harms enacted by the community that trickles in is reflected in our library. Um, I think it's having conversations in the community about those harms that have been uh, that have happened. Um, it is. I think a lot of the times is is providing a holding environment where people can are able to come together and to engage in these kind of conversations and to hear from different people's perspectives to understand when we say harm what is that harm what does it look like um, and how can we deal with it um, and it's not saying that people are putting their harm out there for others to just um, look at and say oh ah and not take anything from it um, but I think it's also for us to think about, okay, in this community, what has happened historically? I, I, I talk a lot about historical um, aspects because a lot of times we don't know some of these things that has happened. Um, we don't know that like, you know, Florida has had, it's very similar to the Tulsa race massacre, you know, that was very close by to Alachua County, you know, and that some of these histories are passed down um, and that people come with them and they approach them. Even thinking about institutions such as UF um, that has a huge influence on the Gainesville and Latua County community, but there's a lot of harm that has been had in the community by institutions and universities. So what are, what are those and how do we acknowledge them and how do we have those conversations, but how do we have the resources necessary to provide the support? So it's not just one community outreach person for like, 50,000 people, that you have somebody who's overworked and overboarding and you don't have the necessary resources. And then people start to think that you're not serious about this, that this is just a checkbox, that this is something that you only wanna throw money at and acknowledge right now because of, it feels good, it looks good, um, but is it really good for that community that has been harmed in the long run? No. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking uh, as you were speaking and I'm looking, uh, reading some of the messages coming through the chat um, and back to the initial question I asked you, I'm thinking about Tracy Hall, who is a black woman uh, at the helm of the American Library Association. Thinking of Dr. Carla Hayden, who is at the helm of the Library of Congress. And I can only imagine uh, some of their silences and some of the things being thrown at them. Uh, for you know, trying to do the work that they do. If you had the opportunity to talk to either them uh, or other people who might have the opportunity to make some of these changes or at least stir the pot enough to you know, uh, create some change, uh, what might you say to them? Oh gosh, oh. Um... First of all, I have to make sure that I don't swoon or faint. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> First, um, you know, um, if I, if, oh man, that's a really good question. Um, I think, um, first I would say uh, thank you for your service. 
Um, and I would say, I'm sorry. I am sorry for all the things you've had to go through. I'm sorry for the people who would never say, I'm sorry, and apologize for the things that they have had to go through and they've put them through. Uh, so those are the things I would, I would say first. And I think for me, um, it would be, um, what can I do to help create a future where there are more than just Tracy Halls and Carter Hayden, where there is so much of us that it is not solitary or lonely at the top or in the middle, um, or you know, even at the bottom um, or just kind of on the front lines. You know, for me, it would be, um, what are some key things that I can learn so that I am able to maybe endure less suffering and make the path easier for other people who are coming mm -hmm. after me. You know, I do this work, not one, because I love being a parent, but, but two um, is to pay it forward and make it easier for folks coming um, after me, um, but also to make it more easier, more comfortable um, or less lonely for people who are already here. Mm -hmm. You know, because there have been people who've been in this profession for, for, for centuries. Um, and I can't imagine the struggles they've had to deal with. But for me, it's to be able to make someone, I would probably crack a joke to make them laugh, because I don't know how often they laugh. Um, you know, but I would, I would just say, um, because of you, we are, we, because of you, we exist. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate that. Lovely. Thank you. And with that, we are just about at time. So I want to thank Twana again so sincerely and so enthusiastically for joining us today uh, and helping us have these hard conversations. Um, Twana, there's so much in the chat about you giving folks food for thought and things to think about and thank you for giving them language and, and et cetera. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us. I see some familiar faces and I see some new faces and just very pleased and, and grateful that you all chose to spend some time with us today. Uh, again, uh, please check out the uh, diversity lecture homepage for information about Tawana's talk and the recording that will show up there uh, maybe within a week or so. And please join us next week uh, for the final lecture of the season, which will feature Shannon Jones and Beverly Murphy, uh, two wonderful African-American medical librarians who are uh, doing big things and, and really uh, getting us more familiar with uh, that portion of the profession. So please join us again. Thank you so very much to all. Uh, enjoy your evening and we will meet again soon. Thank you.